Welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Ames, Associate Curator of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. This is Season 2, History Behind the Scenes, in which we explore the Rosenbach's remarkable historical collections, travel behind the scenes into the work of the institution to preserve its treasures, and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day American civic life. Today, I'm sitting in the Rosenbach's reading room with two of my wonderful colleagues for a conversation about how the Rosenbach makes new acquisitions for its collections. We'll get a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the collecting process and study a few items that we recently added to our American history holdings. When you walk into the Rosenbach's historic spaces, like the dark, atmospheric East and West libraries, where the majority of our rare books reside, it might initially seem like the institution is frozen in amber, as if it hasn't changed since our founders inhabited these spaces in the 1950s. Our historic rooms, filled with collections objects, certainly are peaceful and contemplative. But in truth, they are hives of activity, and new items are regularly being added to our library shelves. The Rosenbach has an active collecting program, by which I mean that we regularly work with auction houses, rare book dealers, collectors, and friends of the institution to bring new objects into our collections. Collecting remains a key part of the strategic work that we do at the Rosenbach. Today, I'll talk with two people who shape that collecting mission and play a pivotal role in growing and refining the Rosenbach's world-renowned collections. Judith M. Gustin is Curator and Senior Director of Collections at the Rosenbach, where she oversees the care of our collections and manages the work involved in growing our holdings. Elizabeth E. Fuller is the librarian of the Rosenbach, whose deep knowledge of our collections informs our strategy in making new acquisitions. Judy and Elizabeth, thanks to both of you so much for joining me for this conversation today. Thanks, Alex. It's always fun to talk about the collections. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be here. Judy, I'll start our conversation with you. I know that the founders of our institution, Philip and Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach, left our museum and library a large number of artifacts upon their deaths, but the collection has really grown significantly since then. Can you give me a sense of how our holdings have expanded since our founders' time? Sure. Um, First of all, we usually say that our collection has grown by about a third since our founders' day, but that growth is not equally distributed. Um, So a lot of the collections that we're most known for are actually collections that have increased in uh, both content and visibility since the time of the museum's founding in 1954. So it really is, um, you know, incumbent upon us as professionals here to really sort of grapple with, um, you know, what what was here? How did those things grow? How have previous staff members seen that growth um, as being important to the work that they did at their time? And how do we understand the growth that we are attempting to achieve as a response to the needs and strategies of our institution as it is today? Judy, sticking with you for a moment, um, what would you say our strategy is in collecting? Is it a formalized, written sort of, you know, quasi-scientific approach that we take to this work? Or is it a little bit more serendipitous and personality-driven? And what would you say our goals and objectives in collecting are today, you know, in, in the 21st century? So what we what we find is that um, there are documents that are necessary if you are um, you know participating in um, the larger community of museums who have established best practices with regards to acquiring materials for their collections and we do have documents that are approved by the appropriate committees and board of the museum that govern how we collect um, mostly the specifics of it not so much the details of content. But what comes into play in terms of content is overall museum strategic planning. Um, and that com- what comes with that is um, 
you know, things like we want to expand our audience. So we have to know what our audience is. We have to know what those areas of expansion are going to look like. And then we have to think about what kinds of materials we should introduce to the collection to um, engage those communities um, and those populations. So for us, it's really about not only understanding the history of collecting here at the Rosenbach and the best practices that most museums is, tend to depend on to uh, to govern acquisitions policy, but also what it is we want to respond to in the communities we want to engage and how we can best do that. So for us, it really means uh, sort of grappling with the needs of the institution for it to be healthy and to continue, and the needs of our communities as well, and what they want to see here, but also looking back and seeing how that fits into our uh, founder's strategy, uh, the things that they collected, the basis for collecting that we have already embedded in the collections, um, and we proceed accordingly. So it's got, you know, multiple sort of uh points of, of input uh, as we discover what's also out there in the market that enables us to collect. And that market can include dealers and auction houses, as well as donors, um, individuals and families who uh, donate materials that they may own to our collections. Elizabeth, explain to me the nuts and bolts of how the Rosenbach staff decide what we should add to the collection and how we go about doing that work. We don't have, as some uh, collectors uh, and institutions do, a defined wish list. Uh, we want to keep all our options open. There are so many things that we don't know about the existence of. Um, there are a few things we, uh, we have said from uh, time to time, oh yes, we should have a copy of that. But in general, we think in terms of identifying the gaps in in our collections, part where collections are particularly strong and there's just a, a, a small amount of, of things that would really help to fill something in. Uh, we also keep our eyes out for things that create new connections among different parts of the collection. We get information about available objects from all over. We read auction catalogs and bookseller catalogs, dealers and auction houses, uh, and contact us directly. Our board members and friends keep an eye out for things that they think might interest us and let us know. Uh, individuals who have things to uh, sell or donate will contact us directly. When we find out about something, uh, then the collection staff talk it over among ourselves, and the, we ask a number of questions. Does this thing have a relationship to our existing collections? Something may be the most interesting, desirable thing in the world, but if it's going to exist in isolation here, it won't do, it won't be of any use to anyone. So it needs to be connected to things we already have here in terms of the subject, the author, the genre, the period, etc. We also ask if it would help us to tell or expand the stories of those existing collections. Would it fill the gaps we've been talking about? Would it create some of those new connections? We also have to be sure that it is suitable for actual use. Uh, it needs to be in condition that it can be displayed, can be handled. Uh, we want to be able to use it in public programs of all kinds, exhibitions, presentations, uh, hands-on tours, and so on. We also ask if it, if it is something that would have research value. Do the people who already come to study objects in our collections, is it something that they would also be interested in looking at that could tell them something new? We, as Judy mentioned, we're looking particularly at our uh, strategic objectives of really telling stories that expand our audiences. Um, and uh, we're looking for um, things that uh, tell stories of underrepresented 
people and groups uh, that amplify voices that are not sufficiently heard in our collections, um, which were like most um, uh, special collections uh, libraries in this country, based on a canon of dead white European men. There are, of course, uh, our founder's vision was uh, a bit broader than that, but there's still a lot of uh, a lot of people and a lot of stories that aren't sufficiently told by our existing collection. So we always look for things that will bring that out. We want to make sure, again, that that things can be used. Um, is it? Uh, are we looking for just a beautiful, clean copy of something? which is attractive in its way, but we also like the things that show how people have used them over the years. We like things with annotations, with repairs, with things that show that these were objects made to be and actually were used and loved. Of course, we uh, once we have all of that, we want to know, is this uh, uh, rare enough and important enough or rare enough thing to be part of our collection? There's also the question of something's value to us as opposed to um, its absolute value. We need to think about uh, not only the price, but existing, uh, but uh, additional costs to import something, etc. What are our opportunities for buying it? Do is this something we have the funds for? Is this something that would be a particular interest to? someone who might help us purchase it, and so on. One question we ask ourselves uh, in relationship to uh, affording something, if something is offered to us as a donation, would we want it if we had to pay for it? Um, uh, the attraction of something simply being free isn't, isn't uh, enough. Is it actually worth it to us to... Um, is it something that we would value enough to pay for. Once we, once we have discussed all those questions among ourselves, we may well need to go back uh, to the uh, to whoever's offering it and find out more. Uh, we may need to satisfy ourselves about how they acquired it. What do they have clear title to it? Do we need to examine it in person? Do we have questions about its condition or the way it's described? Uh, can we uh, get it on approval or get an opportunity to examine it? One of the other big questions, of course, uh, which I should have mentioned earlier, is, is it something we have room for and something that we have uh, that we can actually take care of. Our storage space is limited. Very large collections that take up a lot of room are something that we'd have a lot of trouble fitting in right now. Um, is it something that would require a lot of special care, conservation, delicate handling, specialized storage conditions? Is that something that we can actually do? Once we have satisfied uh, ourselves of all that, then uh, if collection staff decide we'd like to acquire something, we uh, uh, bring our, that, our recommendation to the director. And depending on uh, the uh, amount of uh, funds involved, uh, there may be, we may also require approval by a committee of the board. So we will make a, a formal proposal there. Once the approval is made, then uh, there, there may be additional formalities uh, involved with deeds of gift, purchase, import, et cetera. And um, all those details uh, continue to the moment the uh, thing arrives on our doorstep and the uh, invoice is paid. Judy, one of the things that has really struck me during my four years on the staff of the Rosenbach is the seeming role that personal relationships with auction houses, with rare book dealers, with donors and collectors uh, play in informing our um, acquisition strategy and in making us aware of materials that might be available on the market. Can you give me a sense of both for, from, from your ass assessment, what role individual person-to-person -person relationships play in this process and um, how that shapes you know, the, the, the contours of our collecting program? 
Sure. I can tell you a little bit more about that, but you know, it really does um, play into every aspect of, of acquiring materials for our collections, starting with um, how we sometimes find out about things that are available, whether it's um, members of our board or larger community who themselves are collectors and they're watching the auction houses and um, they, you know, jump in and say, wouldn't this be great for the Rosenbach's collection? So in some ways, the uh, personal relationships we have with people who are directly involved in our community sort of put us on the trail of things we might not have otherwise noticed. But um, more than that, um, we do have um, long, um, you know, long-standing relationships with dealers and auction houses um, over the years, so that we can really help ourselves by explaining to these people who have their finger, fingers on the pulse of the market what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, and this often makes sure that they notify us when they see something that they think is particularly good for us, or when we see them in person, as we often do at uh, book fairs and other events, to be able to um, discuss with them, you know, this is what we're looking for to connect these two objects. Um, can you think of anything that you might have that would help us out there? Same holds for um, for auction houses when they know that we're looking for certain things and they're coming up in an upcoming sale. We often get notice that they're becoming available on the market. But also there's the issue of donations. And we have a, a reputation in the areas where we do collect. And so it makes it a little easier for uh, people who have things that are coming down to, to them from their, their family um, or whose family may not be interested in continuing on with collecting. Um, and so they can pretty easily find um, you know, that we are the holders of other things related to the objects they have. And then they usually check in um, with me or with Elizabeth to say, you know, I'm thinking about, um, you know, either selling or donating um, these objects that I have. Would you be interested in them? And that starts a very long conversation around what it is they're trying to achieve by donating this to us or selling it to us and how it fits into our collection or sometimes does not. Um, and sometimes it's really just about, particularly for people who come to us never having worked with a museum before, they know they want their important collections um, in a place where they will be safe and cared for and used by the public, but they really don't know what that entails. And so we often try to talk to them about how their objects would be used, how they would be stored, um, how they would be credited um, to the person donating them. By credited, I mean that if a donor gives us objects uh, that they have collected and wish to be in the museum, we will have a credit line anytime that object appears in public, whether that's on our website or in an exhibition. Um, so we are showing our gratitude in perpetuity um, by giving the credit line that the donor wishes to have, whether it's a gift of or in memory of or in honor of someone, um, that we make sure that that's noted each time the public sees this object um, so that they can see that we are deeply um, indebted to people who share their collections with us by donating them. Um, and so those relationships really are, um, in some ways, the heart and soul of creating this collection. As we look back over time, we see how many of our objects that we use regularly do have credit lines. We, you know, those of us who've been here for a while remember purchases that were made with the assistance of dealers or um, representatives of auction houses. And so uh, it really does, um, you know, show its face throughout the collection over time one does get a sense of how this process involves an entire community of support, as you described, Judy. There are the, the, the staff experts who understand the contours of the collection. There are dealers and other people out there in our community who um, have a vested interest in helping the Rosenbach stay um, progressively on top of uh, the, the field in terms of growing the collection um, and building on our strengths. So that's really, really interesting to, to think about, um, which of course leads to um, sort of a, a question that underlies all of this work, namely uh, the financial side of this 
of this work. Um, Judy, can you tell me more about the financing of acquisitions? How do we go about assembling the money that it takes to purchase items uh, and, and bring them into the collection, and particularly to do that work quickly when we know that we may be engaging in an open market where private collectors and other institutions could be interested in some of the objects in which we are interested? How do we both gather the resources we need to do this and then do so in, in an efficient, expeditious fashion? So the Rosenbach has an acquisitions fund that is not very large, uh, given our aspirations. Um, And so we know basically what we have to spend. um, And it's a dedicated fund um, that's invested. So if the market does well, it does well. And if the market doesn't do well, it doesn't do as well. Um, So, you know, we really, that's a very precarious way um, to, to approach building your collection if that's all you've got to depend on. Um, we do hope all the time that we will be expanding that acquisitions fund. And um, at the same time, we work not to have to spend that money by trying to attract um, interested donors to help us make purchases that we want, and by also looking to bring things into the collection by way of donation. So it is a uh, delicate dance um, that happens when we see something that we want. We have to figure out what it's going to cost us. Some of these things are um, going to be in upcoming auctions, and we have to come up with a, uh, an idea about what the, um, the price may eventually be. Auction catalogs always show you a range of prices, um, you know, as an estimate for what you can assume you might be paying. But frankly, um, you know, the, the auction business has been pretty healthy, um, particularly with regard to rare books lately. So we have to assume that it may cost us quite a bit more. Um, and we usually come up internally with a figure that uh, we think we will need in order to be successful in bidding on something at auction. And when we work with people who are individuals who want to sell to us, um, we do the same with them. We, we try to negotiate a price that's reasonable for both sides of this equation. And when we work with dealers, we do the same thing. We, we talk about, um, you know, a, about what they can, what can, they can give us as, as, uh, 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 consideration uh, for our being a nonprofit institution. So um, as we work through these, we we come up with the number we'll need, and then we think about whether we have members of our community, whether they are, um, you know, already you know, fixtures like members of our young friends group or people who've donated to us before, or whether they're people we'd like to bring in specifically for this object because they may have an interest in its being at the Rosenbach and in our collections. So we attempt to contact people who might be supportive of this endeavor. Um, and we find a way to, um, to harness all of our resources to either purchase the object or we realize that it's not really going to work. So that every time we look at objects that we would potentially like to have in our collections, we often say to ourselves, well, how does this rate against things that we could have and we would like to spend money on? And we decide whether we need to pass up on something in order to get something else that we really do want. So this is a constant negotiation that goes on. Um, It would be wonderful if someday in the future we had such a large acquisitions fund that we really didn't have to worry about all of this. But at the same time, it is a discipline and collecting is a discipline. And so we take seriously our obligation to spend the money that we have at our disposal wisely and to only engage donors for this if it's something that our collection really does require. I've asked each of you to showcase today an example of a recent Rosenbach acquisition that really um, exemplifies how we go about doing the work of growing and refining collections in the way that you both have described. And I'll start with Elizabeth uh, to share what you've decided to uh, focus your comments on today. And I'm going to ask you, Elizabeth, both maybe to say a word of introduction about the American history collections at the Rosenbach broadly conceived, uh, and then move into this individual object that you are focusing on today. Listeners of the of the season uh, two of Rosenbach podcast know that we are taking a specific look at our American history holdings. So I just want to make sure that everyone has a good sense of this domain of our collection, uh, and that will help 
help us make sense of how this particular object uh, fits into that broader category. Our American history collections uh, are strongest in the period from the very early European explorations up through the American Civil War. In the earlier period, it includes both North and South America uh, as we get uh, further up in time toward uh, United States independence, the geographical focus narrows somewhat and is more concentrated in the United States. There are manuscripts and printed books, broadsides, and maps, some of the most uh, common uh, genres and topics are accounts of European explorers, their descriptions of the land and the native peoples and their encounters with them. Uh, there are um, There's material in Native American languages uh, specifically produced for, by and for, Christian missionaries uh, trying to convert the indigenous people, uh, they typically learn the language and then devise because uh, these cultures didn't have written languages, but uh, so the, the, the missionaries would devise ways of writing them down, uh, translate their scriptures or their liturgical materials, uh, and then print them uh, and use them uh, for Most of them were for the use of missionaries. Later on, some of them were for the use of converted Native congregations. Um, So we have uh, not enormous numbers of these things, but we have about two dozen uh, languages um, represented all together. A few um, accounts by uh, Native people themselves, some of the earliest uh, uh, published memoirs. Um, There are, of course, documents produced by the earliest colonial governments, uh, both in, uh, on the ground in, uh, the new world and in the, uh, in England and Spain, particularly, and, and the other, uh, European centers of the colonial powers. There are also a lot of examples of, that were collected as examples of the earliest printing in different places. So you can see the the uh, growth and development of of printing, which follows the uh, the track of of European settlement, there are also works of uh, is that their political philosophy, of course, along with the government. There are also early works of literature, the earliest works of uh, what we know as American literature, uh, the poems of Anne Bradstreet, the poems of Phyllis Wheatley, published in both in London and then in, in uh, Boston. Um, there are uh, personal letters uh, and uh, papers documenting the, the lives and the businesses of mostly of uh, well-known uh, uh, people, politicians, statesmen, soldiers, uh, uh, the, the figures you've heard of uh, in history. There are both... Um, they're both papers documenting their uh, their political and their business dealings, as well as their family lives. There are also uh, smaller collections of newspapers and um, maps and other documents that cover all the same periods and, and places and topics. Uh, I've got here two little volumes that are French translation of Benjamin Franklin's published accounts of his experiments in electricity. This was brought to our attention uh, last April, April 2021, uh, by Derek Dreyer, who had just retired as our director, but uh, uh, still uh, retains an an interest in uh, our our goings-on. And he had just seen that among the uh, books coming up for auction at Swan Galleries were several uh, Benjamin Franklin imprints, uh, including this one. Um, he wasn't. Uh, uh, he didn't recall if we had any of Franklin's writings on electricity, uh, but thought we ought to know about it. So uh, Judy and I looked over this first, and um, uh, one of our first questions was: um, Is this something we 
really ought to be adding to the to the collections now is this does this in general meet the the standards for significance and and notability and how interpretable is it uh it's not the first edition of this work it's the second it's in french which certainly we have a lot of works in french and all kinds of languages other than english but uh is it you know, would that be a barrier to interpretation? We do have a large collection of Franklin. It's not comprehensive, but certainly a work by Benjamin Franklin is is a reasonable thing to think about. So we looked a little farther into it. And first, how does it fit into our Franklin collections in general? Uh, Dr. Rosenbeck felt a great affinity for Franklin. They were both Philadelphians and bookmen and lovers of good living. So he acquired a lot of Franklin material to which we've added over time and without necessarily having planned it uh, in the long term, we've managed to uh, assemble um, uh, material that covers pretty much every phase of his career. There are the famous Poor Richard Almanacs. There are a lot of other products from his press that illustrates his early career as a printer. We have some of his own published writings. We have personal correspondence and other uh, documents. We have some some personal letters. We have correspondence about um, uh, a business of uh, business he conducted on behalf of the Pennsylvania colony and then with the Continental Congress and uh, 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 relating to the uh, early independence of the United States. So uh, his career is pretty well covered. We didn't have any of his writings on electricity, which of course is one of the things he is most famous for. That hadn't necessarily been a gap we felt was a a really yawning one. History of science in itself isn't a great specialty of our collections, but there is a lot of scientific material scattered throughout the collections. And in fact, in the American historical collections, we already have a couple of pieces um, by Ebenezer Kinnersley, uh, who was another early uh, experimenter in electricity who collaborated with Franklin on several things. So there was a lot of warrant for acquiring this this work for the collection. Is the second edition all right? Well, uh, if you look at the title page, it says that it's revised and augmented with a considerable supplement with notes and new experiments. After Franklin had published first published uh, the first accounts of his experiments in 1751, he published several additional groups of experiments first in English. Uh, so the second edition now is has additional material by the author himself. So in this case, not being a first is not a problem at all. It's in French. Well. Franklin spent a lot of time in France. France was an important center of science in the period. It shows, in fact, the international reach of science and Franklin's own involvement in these international endeavors. It's also printed by a woman-owned firm, the Colophon, the statement at the end. So the title page mentions mentions uh, uh, the the publisher, who's one of the uh, significant publishers uh, in, in in Paris at the time, Durand. Um, but the colophon, the little statement at the end, says that it was printed on the press of the widow de la Tour. Um, very common uh, for centuries for women to work alongside their husbands in their businesses and to often inherit and continue to run the businesses after their husband's death. Sometimes it took, uh, there were, uh, you know, legal permission was required, uh, but there were quite a lot of French women, women in other places as well, who were running presses after their husband di- husbands died. Uh, she seems also to have been from a, a, a family in the book business herself, so uh, that Madame de la Tour uh, certainly knew her books and, in fact, did do the printing for a number of significant uh, Paris publishers. That's one of those hidden stories that we like to bring out in the collections, and we can use this this object to, to do that as well. To return to the question of, of its being in French, 
even our uh, visitors who uh, might only read English, when it comes to scientific language, most of the principal words uh, have, have cognates in English. So you can see uh, experiments and observations in electricity looks pretty much the same in French and English. Because it's a topic people already connect with Franklin, they already know about it. So uh, it, it would catch people's eye even without uh, some interpretation, which we're, of course, uh, always, always uh, like to provide. I mentioned Fra uh, Franklin's involvement in uh, international scientific endeavors. Paris was a real center of scientific inquiry at the time. And we have in our continental literature collection one of the really important products of that, one of the most uh, amazing to me pieces in our collection is a 56 volume edition of the Natural History, uh, published over a period of 50 years by a team based at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Paris, headed by the Comte de Buffon, who was the general editor uh, until his death, and so his name is always connected with it. Uh, this uh, published accounts gathered from uh, literature and explorers and teams of correspondents wherever they could find them all over the world to attempt to systematically describe all the creatures of the earth. Uh, it also happens to have fantastic, beautiful illustrations. Um, so that, that object bridges our uh, literature and art collections, and this Franklin piece uh, bridges the American historical and the continental collections. Um, Looking further into it, we found after we acquired it that, in fact, Franklin had um, this book, became, this Franklin translation came about because of Buffon. Franklin, knowing uh, how important a uh, figure in science Buffon was, had asked uh, his collaborator and, and correspondent, Peter Collinson, to be sure to give Buffon a copy of his English book. And Buffon had it translated into French, where, of course, it caught the attention of the world scientific community and spread Franklin's own experiments that much further. Given that it would boost our science-related uh, collections uh, so significantly, uh, it gives us the potential, if we um, uh, want to get into uh, STEM programming, it's another great uh, way to connect, uh, to connect there. Given all this, of course, uh, this work was a, uh, an obvious uh, thing to add to our collections. Was this the right copy? It's in good, solid condition. It's not an original binding, but it's, uh, we didn't need an original binding for our purposes. It's in a, an attractive and uh, solid, which is important for being able to handle and use it, solid binding. Uh, and the, uh, the starting estimate uh, price uh, seemed quite reasonable. The next thing to do uh, is to see, all right, is this a reasonable price? So we looked at uh, the auction history. Have copies of this book sold at auction recently? And what prices uh, have, they, uh, have they given? Are they comparable copies? And uh, how much have they sold for? Are there others being offered by dealers at the moment? And what is the range of prices those are selling for? So I found that several copies of this and the first French edition had, in fact, been sold in recent years. And there were four or five copies uh, for sale at the moment by a variety of booksellers. The price uh, being asked for uh, the one that was coming up at auction uh, seemed quite reasonable in comparison with uh, all uh, the, the prices asked and realized for all of these, as well as being reasonable in absolute terms. So uh, Judy and I agreed that we would uh, propose that for acquisition. Elizabeth, that's such a fascinating story. And I think one thing that really comes through in, in your description of the process that you, Judy, and the rest of our team undertook to acquire this object 
is the extent to which rare books at the Rosenbach are objects that get interpreted to visiting members of the general public who come on house tours, who come on hands-on tours, who come on other programs. Um, it, I think it's such a distinctive feature of the work that we do that it's obviously your research value, scholarly value is a part of the conversation, but we, we really think about spending our resources to bring objects into the collection that will be meaningful for everyday visitors who, who pop in to learn more about the Rosenbach. So that's a, a great story. And I will note to listeners that we've put some photographs of this volume online for you to see at rosenbach.org slash podcast. If you want to see the title page, see the a binding of this book, you can check it out online. So thanks again very much, Elizabeth. And now we'll move on to Judy to hear about what what object or objects you selected to uh, illustrate these uh, theories of collecting at the Rosenbach. Thanks, Alex. So I want to take a little bit of a long view um, when we talk about collecting, because we've been talking a little bit about that um, during our conversation today, about how our collection started, how it got built, who was responsible for building it. So I want to talk about a group of acquisitions that um, actually we've talked about before in um, last season's podcast episode, I think, too. Um, and those are the Gratz family portraits that inhabit our parlor at the Rosenbach. So we've discussed them in some detail um, in that conversation, but I really want to connect them to the history of collecting that group of objects over time, because it's so important as we talk about whether, you know, the potential new acquisition actually belongs here, um, that we build on uh, past collecting to really round out our collections and to make sure that each object has other objects that it can essentially speak to and therefore create a story that we tell to the public through them. So those Gratz portraits, um, the most recent of which came in in the uh, the the 20 teens. Um, I think actually further, further along than that, maybe, maybe a little later, I, I don't really have that number in mind, but we collected some of them pretty recently. A whole new group came in between um, the period after our most recent renovations to the building um, in 2003 and into the late 20, 20 teens. So these were brought in because there were existing portraits here, some of which had come uh, immediately after our founders' deaths and the, at the time of the opening of the museum in, in 1954. And those were brought in in part because uh, one of our founders, Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach, had had um, a relationship with um, a member of the Gratz family who lived in Kentucky, um, Henrietta Gratz Clay. Um, and that relationship was based on the even earlier relationship between the Gratz and the Rosenbach families that started very early in the, uh, the 19th century. So, uh, and that uh, came to be due to an adoption between uh, Michael Gratz, who provided one of his own sons to a dear friend and business uh, collaborator, um, Aaron Levy, uh, who was an early uh, Jewish settler here in Pennsylvania, but was um, an ancestor of Dr. Rosenbach's mother. So these families had been uh, connected for a long time through this adoption, and members of the Gratz family were responsible for essentially um, creating um, a, a, a sort of enlargement of the materials that our founders themselves had collected because of their relationship to this early Jewish family in Philadelphia. So we see that our founders uh, were very interested in collecting objects from the Gratz family's business concerns. They were merchants, and they were very early um, into the expansion of the landmass of, of the United States through uh, landholding companies that existed um, both before, during, and after the American Revolution. So we have a lot of documents that relate to the Gratz's business dealings, many of those 
those dealings having to do with people um, like Benjamin Franklin, who um, Elizabeth just um, talked about, um, and also families like the Whartons and other important Philadelphia families who were participating in this this early sort of uh, sort of land holding um, business out towards um, the Ohio River Valley, um, some of it down in in uh, what became the the sort of long end of the expanded version of Virginia that happened um, in the early years of our country. So um, they co- they collected a lot of these early documents um, and added to them. Uh, other documents such as personal correspondence, uh, maps, um, silver, and other household items. And a lot of those kinds of things, the sort of uh, more fine and decorative arts objects, were added to our collections through people like Dr. Rosenbach's friend, Henrietta Gratz Clay, and um, a cousin of hers um, who also uh, descended from Benjamin Gratz, one of Michael Gratz's uh, sons and the second generation of Gratz's here in America. And they gave a a lot of their family holdings to the museum through their wills. And then since then, the museum, through its various curators, has been acquiring more materials related to that. So you can see that we start with a collection our founders began, and then we expand it in all directions to sort of enhance the storytelling components that we can offer to the public. Um, And in some ways leading right to these latest acquisitions, the portraits that are in our parlor. And I have to say that the Gratz family members um, who have been donors of some of these objects have also been supporters of the ongoing care of these collections. It's essential that we find the means to care for our collections as well as the means to acquire them. So we're very grateful that Many members of the current Gratz family, um, in uh, coming from a variety of places around the country and even um, in Canada, um, have added to our ability to care for these collections, which we are now conserving through a portrait and frame conservation project um, that whose first um, half was funded entirely to do, entirely from donations by members of the Gratz family. We're seeking to expand that support beyond um, members of the Gratz family to our larger um, community. These. Um, objects are seen uh, by everyone who comes here uh, on a house tour and also by people with special interests in uh, not only these portraits, but who do research in the Gratz family's um, businesses and personal correspondence. So, um, so this really ties everything together very neatly in both expanding our founder's collection, um, adding to it over time, and then caring for it in the present. So um, this is part of collecting that we have to see to um, over our time here and hope that future curators and librarians um, will also see fit to find ways to expand and enrich um, this particular collection as they do other collections and carry it on into the future. Judy, thank you so much for sharing those reflections about the Gratz collection. And I think it's a wonderful reminder of just how diverse and vast the um, American history collections are in covering so many media and giving a really, you know, figuratively and literally a multidimensional um, perspective on early American history, early Philadelphia history, and early Jewish American history through this really, you know, very, very important collection. Elizabeth, I want to return to you for a moment and ask if someone is interested in coming to the Rosenbach to see the objects that we've discussed today, or for that matter, any of our other holdings, how would they go about uh, arranging to make such a visit? For a uh, for a, a look at the Gratz portraits that Judy has been talking about, uh, those are seen on every house tour. Um, for a more focused um, view of, uh, of collections, to look at uh, specific objects to uh, be able to look at and handle uh, books and manuscripts and other collections objects. Uh, 
we uh, welcome people to make research appointments. Uh, we require an appointment just to make sure that uh, the material you want to see is in fact on site and not uh, being conserved or on loan somewhere, uh, and to make sure that there is space available in the reading room and staff uh, have the time to work with you. Um, but you don't have to have any academic credentials or any specific research uh, project in mind. A significant portion of our researchers are people who are just interested in the objects. Uh, some people very knowledgeable about them, some people not yet so knowledgeable, but they're taking uh, the opportunity to learn. On our website, uh, on the main menu, you'll find a whole section for research. You may want to first uh, investigate the uh, section for research policies. Uh, there is a form uh, that you can use to send uh, questions uh, to the um, collection staff. Uh, if you're ready to request an appointment, there's a form uh, to fill out for that as well. It asks for a lot of information, but it's, uh, it's all information we need for our records or to begin the process of, uh, of talking with you to find out what uh, uh, exactly what you're interested in and what material we have would be uh, would be best for those interests. It looks like a, a long, complicated form. There's no uh, particular uh, automated reservation system on the back end. It comes to me uh, and to other collection staff in an email, and we will we can contact you uh, there by email or phone to follow up. Thanks, Elizabeth, for sharing those details about how, how members of our community can come and make use of all of the wonderful resources you and Judy have described in this conversation. And I'm now going to ask Judy to close out our discussion today. Um, Judy, if someone out there listening to this podcast has antiques or artworks, rare books or manuscripts that they're interested in donating to the Rosenbach that they think might be a fit with our collection, or for that matter, if anyone is interested in learning about how to support our ongoing work in conservation, preservation, and collections access, what steps would you recommend they take to reach out to us and learn more about the possibilities? Well, I'd like to invite everybody who hears this to um, to feel free to be in contact with me and members of our collections team should they think they have something that we might be interested in. I'll just let you know it's it's most uh, easy for everyone if um, you contact us by email and our emails are available on our website um, and just explain what it is you have. Generally, we'll, we'll ask you for, um, if it's books, a list of what those books are, and um, if possible, um, just, you know, quick photographs of their title pages. It helps us understand what, what you have um, and how it might fit into our collections. Um, we do also have, um, you know, general uh, you know, collecting parameters that we can share with you if you want to have an email exchange or a phone call so you know whether the things you have might be appropriate for us uh, more generally. But we're more than happy to work with you to discuss um, the objects that you have, how they might fit in here, and if, if they don't fit in here, what your best approach for finding a place to donate them to, or if you're interested in sale, um, a place to um, try to find out what, what their value is and where they could be sold. Um, so we can help you with all of those things. Um, so we do encourage you to, uh, to be in touch if you want to. It's one of the, um, the, the nicest things we get to do um, is to, to talk to people who care about the kinds of collections that we have here at the Rosenbach and to uh, help them answer questions about their own collections and about how um, our needs might um, you know, work together um, uh, either now or in the future. Um, so please do feel free to be in touch um, and, and we'll be able to have this conversation with you privately. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Judy, for this really fascinating discussion today. I've enjoyed learning more about the strategies behind the Rosenbach's recent American history acquisitions. Thanks, Alex. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, Alex. It was great to talk to you today.
Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. Check back soon for another glimpse into the Rosenbach Museum and Library's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, art, and culture. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and I always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. Our holdings are always accessible to researchers who make a free appointment to visit our reading room. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach Museum and Library and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Membership start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. If you cannot make a financial contribution, please give our podcast a good rating on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to help us build our audience. The theme music for season two of the podcast is a setting of the poem Longings, written by poet, artist, and educator Nellie Rathbone Wright in 1927. Bright co-founded the Black Opals, a collective and literary journal showcasing young Black writers in Philadelphia in the late 1920s. The musical version featured here was performed by Yolanda Wisher, Paul Geis, V. Shane Frederick, Mark Anthony Palacio, and Sir Lance Gamble. I want to flee to a cool the Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation about history on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast. In the heart of me, drums in my ears, and my lips are wet with the tang of the sea.